to them in chief on general web um, types of things, um, particularly uh, web annotation of web data. And tomorrow we're going to have another one on RDF, so on semantic data and query semantic data. And interspersed within these, I'm going to talk um, briefly on how these are um, used within the sensors project, within sensor data on the web. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Let's see what we do. Uh, can I get you to use the microphone here? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. So good morning, everybody, and uh, again, we apologize for the delay. Um, just, just before we start, I just want to know how many, uh, what's the background uh, of the audience? So how many of you have heard about what an ontology is and um, uh, its use, perhaps, in, in real-world applications? So in what? Uh, scenario have you been using uh, ontologies? Or how did you come across this? Did you read it on the web or uh, did you read papers or something like that? Papers or just from school. Yeah. School? Yeah, just a little bit of grad school and a few papers I've read that's good. Oh, okay. So ontology, uh, you you had a grad course uh, on ontologies? Um, it was kind of tangential to what I was doing, so street addressing and stuff like that, geography. Geography? Okay. Okay. Uh, what about you? Uh, how did you come across? Uh, I read about it a bit in preparation for this. Okay. And all of you have Protege installed on your laptops? So, okay. At least one, one who have a laptop. So what I'm going to do is uh, kind of introduce uh, the background of what ontologies are and um, do a little hands-on on actually creating an ontology on Vines. Uh, so Protege already has, uh, when you install Protege, you can from the site download a file called wines.owl, and I'll show you how we create an ontology from that. And then go into um, some part of what how ontologies are actually um, coded up in, in computers. So we there's a standard called web ontology language, so I'm going to talk about owl, and of course Protege we are going to use to actually create the ontology. Okay. So this is how I'm going to uh, divide the talk into. We'll start with some of the basics of what ontology and ontology engineering are all about. Then we are going to uh, actually get on to Protege, try to build an ontology, a simple class uh, hierarchy. Then we get into more advanced stuff about what ontology uh, knowledge, so ontology designing or knowledge presentation, what are some of the more advanced stuff uh, involved in that. Then I'll get on, on to the OWL part and um, give you some references, uh, etc. So this is, um, so I'll switch to another, I need the laptop, need the laptop. Switch to another uh, presentation from uh, one of our collaborators at Stanford. Um, so Natasha, uh, Natalia, she uh, spells sometimes, uh, she has been one of the uh, pioneers in ontology design uh, since this is a talk from 2001 uh, she gave. And um, this uh, basically introduces to, so 2001 ontology was not such a pop popular thing as it is now. We can see many applications right now, but in 2001 hardly anybody had heard about ontologies and semantic web and that kind of things. So. It, the the whole theme is because we're going to use the examples of wine ontology. We'll take the theme of of wine here. So let's say somebody goes to a restaurant and uh, has some kind of seafood. Um, what kind of uh, wine best goes with that particular f seafood? Then you have, of course, all the information about wines and particular regions of France where the wine was produced. Uh, then you have even California wine regions and wines are being produced. Now, and perhaps a book, uh, basically introducing you know the wines to uh, people like me who have no idea of what wines are about. How do we talk to across these different uh, information sources? How can we talk across? How can we share? How can we interoperate? That's where the uh, scenario for using an ontology comes about. So you can think of ontologies as a kind of 
common uh, place or common uh, uh, platform on which all these different sources or different scenarios of usage uh, can be brought together and they can talk the same language, the same vocabulary or the same set of terminologies is what ontologies are all about. Now, the first thing is what is an ontology? We talked about some uh, general scenario. What exactly is an ontology? So, it's basically, if you think, it's, it has a long history in philosophy since uh, Aristotle uh, of trying to capture uh, human knowledge. But here when we talk about ontology, it's a very narrow description or definition in computer science. So what we're talking about is basically an explicit def description of a particular domain. In this case, we're talking about wines. What does an ontology then consist of? It consists of what we call as concepts or terms. So wine, uh, wine producers, what are the ingredients used in wine producing. Then we have some properties or attributes of the concepts or the terms. What we mean by properties or attributes? So for example, a person, a person has a telephone number, an uh, address, maybe a social security number. And so all these features or characteristics of the person are the properties of the term or the concept. So in this case, wine can have the color or um, is it full bodied or not? Or um, is it sweet or that kind of attribute. So that's what the properties or terms are all about. Then you can also have constraints on properties. So for example, um, Bordeaux wine, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, I guess, comes from a particular region in France. Now when we talk about that particular type of wine, and we say, so each wine comes from a particular region, what does this body of wine come from? We put a restriction that only if a wine comes from a particular region in France, Bordeaux, it's called body wine. So it's a, it's a kind of a restriction we are putting on the property of its where it is coming from, where it is being manufactured. So that's what constraints and properties are all, uh, constraints on properties and attributes means. Now individuals is um, what you would say, so these concepts are, you can think of them as generic terms. So for example, cars. Now let's say all um, cars parked in the parking lot out there are all instances or individuals of the class or concept of cars. So here you would say individual bottles, 1984, 1950s, so on, would be individuals of the wine as a class. So what ontology defines is basically a common vocabulary and it helps us to have a shared understanding. So when we say wine, we define and uh, certain characteristics about it, or we, it means something. So when other people use the term, we understand that what context it is being used in, or what it means when you use the term wine, or the manufacturer, or the region. Now, there are many, uh, right now, I mean, this is a somewhat old um, uh, slide, Right now, there are like hundreds of ontologies out there, but some of the common things um, you can look at is categories on the Yahoo website. Now, it's not a, what we would call a true ontology. It's a taxonomy. What it means is a hierarchical structure starting from the most generic concept to very specific concepts. So you can start off as a web page, then you can have finance, Yahoo Finance, uh, Yahoo Mail, uh, Yahoo Cinema, and all that sort of thing. Then you can have catalogs for um, shopping. Amazon.com has a product catalog. Then you have, these are very famous ones, the Unified Medical Language System from uh, NIH, which basically classifies uh, medical terms in uh, 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 biomedical literature, uh, uh, biomedicine per se, not literature. Um, then I'm not familiar with this. Uh, this apparently is for terminology for products and services. So uh, you, two of you said you are familiar, I mean, at least have come across the term ontologies. You actually studied that in grad school. Did you come across some example ontologies? Um? Uh, not only through sort of tangential work with other people. Okay. Um, Could they, you give they, they would show me their work or they'd sort of throw me a paper and I'd, I'd have a look at it. So did they have, did they mention or describe some example ontologies? No. Um, the, really the domain that I was looking at in was street addressing. Mm -hmm. So I, I was interested. I never formalized it, but I was interested in um, kind of like the hierarchy of country, state, uh -huh. locality, street, mm -hmm. relationships between the different geographic entities. 
Uh, could you give an example of a relationship? So, oh, like a state contains multiple localities. Uh huh. Okay. Each street has several houses. And right. So, so that's actually a good example of this. So when we talked about properties, there are different types of properties. The basic one, when you start with taxonomies, is we are going from an abstract concept to very specific concepts. So the relationship is what we call as subclass. From object oriented, you might be very familiar with this. Then there's also the contains or partonomy kind of relationships between terms. So, there are, right now, um, the National Center for Biomedical Ontologies at Stanford, the, Natasha actually, she works there at NCBO. It's an NIH mandated uh, center of excellence for uh, biomedical ontologies. It has about 160 ontologies already listed on its site. So, <clears throat> Now that you have kind of a broad idea of what ontologies are, we can go on to how to actually create an ontology or ontology engineering. Now, when we talk about ontology engineering, um, even though this slide uh, is from 2001 when it was not that well defined, now people have more experience in actually creating ontologies. Uh, so what we are trying to capture through an ontology, the ontology structure, is as kind of a snapshot or a perspective on a particular domain. It can be biomedicine of what we are working on in our NIH funded projects, or it can be wines, or it can be geographical knowledge, but it's basically trying to capture a snapshot of actual real world entities. Now, so what we are trying to do is we are defining the terms in the domain and the relationships between them. So when we define concepts, we call them classes in ontologies. Then we arrange the classes basically, as I said, in a hierarchy. You can start with a country, then a states, then a cities, and then localities, and so on. Then we define the attributes, as I said. It's also called slots. Slots is a kind of a um, uh, 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 traditional or, or, or an old term from because artificial intelligence has been dealing with this knowledge representation kind of problem for lot many years, 40, 45, even 50 years, I think. So slots comes from a, a particular um, language or a framework for knowledge presentation called frames. So that term comes from, is a carryover from that. The, right, these days, slots is not used that much. Then you have individuals, as I said, instances, actual instances, real world instances of the concepts uh, that we define to be particular types of classes. And then we can d define for particular class individuals uh, what are the values for the properties that we had defined. I'll come up, uh, we'll, we'll go over this later on. So we kind of uh, have a brief idea of what an ontology is and what ontology engineering involves. So why should we create an ontology? Before before I go into that, let me ask, you know, I don't want to pick on you. Maybe let's say I can ask Preeti here. Uh, she's been working on uh, our NIH-funded project to develop two ontologies, large ontologies for uh, biomedicine. W why do we need to create an ontology from your experience? Well, um, how do you share um, your data with other people mm -hmm. um, so that standardized form that everybody would um, understand what you have done and why um, all that stuff. Exactly. So that's one of the most fundamental you know, uh, motivations for actually creating an ontology. You want to share, you want to interoperate, you want to uh, get information from other sources and able to operate on that seamlessly without having to go through the traditional data integration issues of trying to reconcile syntactic differences, structural differences, or semantic differences. So what ontologies helps us to do is actually overcome that through this um, creation of a common vocabulary term. Now, so as I said, we have to, so what ontology enables us to do is have a common understanding among people. So if it's a particular domain, for example, in biomedicine, all the doctors or biomedical personnel or biologists can have a shared understanding of what the terms mean. Then this is also very important given that the amount of data that we are dealing with is increasing exponentially. So what it enables us to do is that when we write applications, that use that uh, use uh, that process uh, data with that are tagged or annotated with these ontology terms they're able to process it irrespective of where the data is coming from because those set of terms or tags are standard 
So that helps in processing of data more easily. Then, of course, there's reuse of domain knowledge means if somebody defines a geography ontology, and let's say um, people in our sensor web uh, project want to model that information, they don't have to create an ontology of their own again, or a set of terminology, or a set of you know, a vocabulary on their own. They can reuse what you have defined and adapt it according to their needs. And the good thing is when they tag their data with that ontology, the, you can take their data and operate with it without having to then reconcile or do data integration issues that earlier you had to do in relational databases. So what this table means, what this column means, am I sure that I'm maintaining the integrity constraints on the database columns or not? That kind of issues are mostly, to a large extent, are taken care of by ontologies. So <clears throat> these are... Um, so when we say some more reasons of making the domain assumption explicit, now what we mean by explicit is with respect to not only humans, because for humans it's very easy to interpret a particular concept because we use a lot of our intuitive you know, uh, contextual knowledge. Given a term um, wine, I don't have to, uh, you, you don't have to tell me that it's related to food or drinks or uh, all that sort of thing. I can use my contextual knowledge to interpret that term. But give, it the term, give a term wine to a software, it has absolutely no idea what is it wine it with respect to food or with respect to something else or a color perhaps. So for that, when we make the meaning or the assumptions of a particular term explicit, it's very easy for a software agent or a software process to interpret it correctly and consistently. So that's why it's important to make the domain assumption explicit. Now, um, for updating legacy data, I'll come to that later. It also, uh, from a practical perspective, separates the domain information from the operational information. This is very familiar from object-oriented uh, programming perspective, where we try to uh, uh, separate out, or in case of um, uh, client-server kind of uh, applications, where we try to separate out what the interface looks like and what the data model in the back, back end is. That kind of assumption. So. When we create an ontology, it's just a part of the whole big picture. Ontologies at the heart basically helps us to um, declare or, as, or make explicit the information in databases, knowledge bases, but it also allows us to create all these applications where you can have problem solving, question answering kind of thing. It can, be, it can do high throughput data processing by software agents. Then uh, certain domain independent applications, I'm not sure exactly because from my uh, perspective, ontologies actually help you to do uh, domain specific applications very well. So I, I'm not sure what domain independent applications here means. Okay, <clears throat> any questions still now? Yeah. You mentioned databases real quick. I was just wondering what the impact you saw of this being on like commercial databases. Okay. So I'll try to understand what exactly you mean. Um, when you say databases, you mean relational databases. Right, right. right. Okay. right. So when you have relational databases, for example, in your geography domain, you have, let's say, five tables with two columns each, just, you know, naive, naive assumption. What is the relationship? You, you talked about the containment relationship between a locality and a state, perhaps. In a database, when I store the, in one column the locality and in another column the state, how do I know what's the inform uh, relationship between them? I can give a real-world example. For example, an uh, employee and a company. Uh, sorry, a person and a company. Now, a person can be employed in a company, a person can have shareholding in a company, or a person can have uh, business transactions with a company. If I don't make that relationship explicit, and I have information that this is a person and this is a company, how do I know what is the interaction between them? If it's a shareholder and a company is declaring dividends, then that shareholder has to be given certain amount of money, but not to an perhaps not to a, a business customer. But in case of, uh, for example, there is some um, bug in their latest uh, software release, all the customers have to be informed. The shareholder perhaps, maybe not all the employees have to be informed. 
that relationship is extremely important. And in our lab, and what Dr. Mishet always emphasizes in the semantic web aspect, is this relationship modeling. So database, what we do is we model the entities very well. And uh, we optimize the representation for the storage purposes. It's not optimized for the interpretation purposes. That's the issue. Now, it, it, so there are uh, more fundamental uh, aspects of the differences between the relational model or the uh, entity relation model that we generally use to actually create a database schema and what we term as RDF. That's the representation model that we use to represent semantic web data. And one of the most fundamental differences is this uh, notion of relationship between entities. There are other uh, notions like uh, in semantic web we use unique identifiers for all the entities. What this allows us to do is you say, um, for example, um, uh, this particular clicker has a particular ID. If you are making an assertion about this, let's say this was manufactured by somebody, and somebody else in, let's say, another continent is also making an assertion that don't uh, you have to change the batteries in six months, you can make the assertions independently. So think of the web. People can make assertions about entities independently. How do we integrate, make sure that your assertion and the, the other person's assertion refer to the same object? Well, because both of you use the same identifier, what we call as universal resource identifier, URIs, or unique resource identifier. Does that answer the question? Okay, cool. So, <clears throat> Um, what I'll do is, uh, yeah, we can go over briefly of uh, how we are going to develop the ontology, then we are going to switch over to Pradesh. If anybody else has a question, please stop me anytime. So, think of this particular schema as, um, uh, as a first take on, on what a wine ontology would look like. So, when I talk about a schema is what uh, there are two parts of generally what we when we see an ontology we d differentiate between two parts of an ontology one is the schema that is these classes uh, classes and that's the other part is the individuals the actual things in the real world so you have um, winery being modeled the region being modeled then you have particular winemakers that are being modeled here and the, you see the relationship between the winemakers and the particular types of wine. I think this is a particular type of wine. Um, so this region, some of the best wineries, one of them is this. That um, and this actually is it's, uh, so you uh, this actually can be thought of as an individual. So what I'm or an instance, and we are saying that this is actually a type of winery. So this is the class. This is the individual. Similarly, we can say this is a particular type of wine, and this actually is being produced by this particular winery. So schema, this part we can think of the schema part. This, these things we can think of the instances or the individuals. So, and this relationship basically says, I think they're using a um, kind of colloquial thing. Uh, RDF actually has specific tags called RDF type uh, that you can use to assign saying that this particular uh, entity is a cl class uh, class is an instance of this class winery this is an instance of the class of these type of wines and these are the relationships so this actually gives a very good picture overall picture of what are all the steps in actually creating an ontology so we'll go through each one of them uh, step by step. If anybody has a question, again, please stop me. So it's important because um, I, what we'll do is go over the slides, and then we'll actually follow these steps to actually create an ontology using Protege. <laughs> OK, so uh, theoretically, this is supposed to be uh, uh, you know, uh, one short uh, set of steps. But actually, what it does, uh, what in reality is, it takes a lot of time to create an ontology and it's most often an iterative process. What that means is, for example, uh, we created an ontology uh, starting in 2005 for modeling uh, provenance or uh, information about where 
uh, when we generate data, what are the instruments used and what are the material being used in an experiment that took us two years to create an ontology with about 500 classes and about 1.2 million instances, but it took a lot of time. And that was, uh, so I was working with a biochemist and uh, uh, we were sitting across the hall and we had to collaborate intensely, but it, then also it took about two years to actually create that ontology. So it's most often an iterative process. You create a particular ontology schema, you show it to the domain expert, they don't agree. They say, oh, no, this doesn't make sense. Then you try to change it again, and they agree. You write a software application, but it's not able to answer the question that you were looking for. Then you again go back and try to say, did you model it correctly that the software implementation can answer that question? So it's an iterative process. So we have to do this set of steps again and again. So there's a very interesting, actually, um, um, research area called uh, ontology evolution, or how to version different uh, forms of ontology over time. Uh, you do a release one, then you do a release two, but then you have to make sure, because this is not like a software where we are fixing bugs and then we have a clean cut between each uh, release. The problem here is we have to make sure that uh, there are no logical inconsistencies and that kind of things between the different versions of ontology. Is there, does the software check that for you? Does it check the consistencies? And yes, yes, yes. Uh, so those are called reasoners. Uh, I think either Corey or uh, tomorrow um, Pratik will cover the reasoner part. I won't be covering that. So just to give an overview of, so what are the differences between actually a traditional object-oriented class structure and ontology is, as I said, ontology reflects the structure of the world. It's a real world application. You're taking a snapshot of the real world and trying to represent that. In uh, object-oriented uh, class structure, we are just defining the data and the code. Code means uh, the you know the behavior of uh, as in methods of a particular class. And also, we are data typing in terms of uh, these are what we can call as primitive uh, data types. You know the standard ones in char, string, that kind of things. But um, in ontology, you can have more complex data typing. You can say a particular thing is a type of a car or a wine and that kind of thing. So user-defined kind of data typing is much more used in, in ontologies. So, okay, um, we are going to use, uh, I, <coughs> excuse me. I think you have downloaded or, or Protege 3.4, most probably. Okay, uh, there's a uh, Protege 4 also. This was, uh, as I said, older slide, so they're referring to Protege, a very old uh, release of Protege. But there are other tools uh, like these. Among them, uh, I'm a little familiar with Onto Edit. I have never used uh, these ones, um, but by, and by far the most popular one is Protege in many, many different uh, application domains. So, um, first is, the first step of ontology designing is very important to understand what is the problem that we are trying to solve, what we expect the ontology to do. And that is very important because that will define what you are modeling, the classes, the set of classes that you are modeling, and what are the properties that you plan to model, and how the classes are relate, being related to each other. Because it's not possible, the real world is very complex. And what we're trying to do is have a simplistic representation of the real world to a certain extent. So we have to be very sure what is the scope of this ontology model or schema that we are trying to create. Because it's very often that if we try to create exactly how the real world occurs, either we will be making the ontology schema over complex and unusable, difficult to maintain, that kind of things, or we will run into actually built-in limitations of the ontology modeling language. So, or perhaps even have problems, as you said, the reasoning. Uh, so reasoning is actually one of the most important aspects of when you create ontology and have a set of instances, you do reasoning to get implicit knowledge, and you will run into trouble by creating overly complex schemas. So it's very important to define what is the coverage or what is the ontology going to be used for. So um, 
and so, and what as i said what, what are the type of questions that the ontology should provide the answers for us? That, that that from our experience is very very important to understand from the beginning this is what uh, software applications are going to answer that are going to use this ontology if you are not clear about that then we will always find either the ontology is not uh, doing uh, uh, is not behaving correctly or it's not doesn't have enough cover coverage so some of for the wine scenario that that's our running theme so what are some of the questions that we can answer with the wine ontology so what are the wine characteristics that we should consider when choosing a wine uh, is body of wine uh, red or white uh, is this particular wine goes well with seafood and all that sort of thing so the, using this set of questions as template uh, we keep in mind before actually uh, starting the ontology engineering uh, steps well this actually is very important uh, i mean uh, from a perspective of making sure that we th there is interoperability there will be multiple ontologies you can have a geography ontology somebody else can have a sensor ontology that have some terms about geographical locations and what we want to do is if i have data about sensors in one place and i have data about geographical domain in another place they can talk to each other and how is that possible only if your ontology and the sensor ontology has some interoperability and it's very easy because the geographical terms that you define in your geography ontology are actually can be reused in my sensor ontology to define its location or the place from for which the data is being collected by the sensor so reuse is very important and it's increasingly becoming important because as i said there are 164 ontologies right now at the national center for biomedical ontologies and i have come across ontologies in oceanography in um, the uh, royal ordnance uh, survey in uk they are creating ontologies for all the uh, land uh, features in uk i have uh, come across ontologies about i think um, uh, the fauna and flora of uh, Austra in australia i think cory went to tasmania and they were developing an ontology for rainfall so there are multiple types of ontologies but you can see there are some overlaps so it's very important to re be reusing terms from ontologies that are already out there so it will help towards our goal of finally when we have these set of ontologies the data that we are generating can be easily interoperable yeah one question um you said that uh, there is a Uh, where you can have two ontologies that are not inter interoperable. Mm -hmm. um, like, what, what do you do not to have that scenario? In what cases do you have two different ontologies that cannot be interoperable? So you mean to say they actually cover? There is overlap in terms of what they are modeling, but they don't actually. Is there any other language? Uh, so you you create your ontology. in all in, in all and somebody else thing. something else hmm are they interoperable or they are not have, somebody has to convert their ontology to what common <laughs> so there is another language called obo and many people traditionally in biomedicine have been using obo to develop ontologies as we have come across there are tools to convert obo to owl that can do that the actual representation standard is not that much of a drawback the important issue is the actual concepts and the properties that we have model the representation can be easily taken care of there are automatic tools for that and once you actually see the ontology in a particular language through a visualization tool you can take the concepts and the properties and model it in your own language that's fine but owl by far is most popular because it's a standard it's a standard by the world wide web consortium for representing ontologies so <clears throat> it saves effort but it's more important that they can interact tools that use ontologies can interact and um, also what it ensures is uh, like all the ontologies in ncbo are actually peer reviewed so anybody can go on to the ncbo site and put a post a comment about the quality of the ontology so it's kind of peer reviewed it's been validated that people are actually using it and they know there are some flaws in that or not so 
uh, this, as I said, is kind of old. Uh, you would not. Uh, so, where to find ontologies that we can reuse? Um, NCBO is one of the most popular sites. Uh, you can also uh, find, use um, some ontologies at um, uh, OBO Foundry. It's uh, at Sunny Buffalo. Uh, the main professor, he's a professor from philosophy called, uh, whose name is Dr. Barry Smith. He also has a list of ontologies. He's been working on it, I think, for 17 or 20 years now. He developed ontologies for geography use and for some defense applications also. So you can also look up there to see what kind of uh, ontologies that are listed. And uh, I don't think these are maintained anymore. Um, uh, so NCBO and those kind of sites are better. Psych is, uh, so these are ontology libraries. Upper ontologies is what you would can think of as a, kind of a template. There are more abstract set of terms there. They are not, they're not modeled to, they're not created to model real world entities. They're more abstract, that is, um, like in, in, in software is engineering, we have this set of templates uh, that if anybody can use according to their requirements that think of as abstract class. Upper ontologies are like kind of abstract class. How the method, you, you're familiar with the method signature, but what the actually method is going to do, you can manipulate it according to your own needs. So upper ontologies are abstract models that you basically take those terms, create subclasses of those terms according to your application domain requirements. Now what ha it makes it, I mean, helps, uh, what's its use is if somebody else also takes the same upper level ontology to create a uh, domain ontology for their own requirements, because the common link between those two domain ontologies is this upper level ontology, the interaction between the ontology is easier through the upper level ontology. So that's the idea. But uh, as Preeti said, the reuse is very important. And this is just uh, another way of ensuring reusability or interoperability between ontologies. Um, so uh, DMOS, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, um, is a, a kind of a, a general taxonomy of, of uh, web pages. Uh, and it was very uh, popular and uh, saw a lot of work. I'm not sure how well it is being maintained now. WordNet, of course, is very popular for uh, in natural language processing applications. Then I talked about UMLS. Gene ontology is actually one of the most famous ontologies out there that uh, irrespective of which country we are talking about, if you are talking to a biologist, they would have heard of gene ontology. So people in Japan use it on the database to annotate terms with gene ontology terms. In UK, Australia, of course, in North America, everywhere. So what this basically uh, gene ontology does, it has created a set of terms for a particular three um, um, uh, subdomains of biology. One is uh, biological processes, cellular components, and molecular functions. And what they have done is they have associated with this con each concept uh, ID, uh, alphanumeric ID. So it says go um, colon 000123. And you have data and you associate that particular ID with uh, go 12345. If somebody, some other application or some other group takes the data, they know how to interpret it. As I was saying, you know, ontology, when you annotate the ontology terms to data, it makes uh, the interpretation consistent and also correct. So that is how gene ontology is being used right now. When you sequence a, uh, a, 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 a genome of a particular organism, you associate Go IDs with different segments of the gene, talking about their functions, talking about their uh, location perhaps, or even talking about what kind of proteins they can code for. So this is one of the most... Um, famous examples out there. Okay, now we actually come down to brass tags. Um, the, as I said, when we build an ontology, these are a set of classes. And what we are doing is, we are going to do is, basically we are going to enumerate all the relevant terms in that particular domain that we want to model in our ontology. Make a list, basically. Then we are going to create a list of properties that we think the terms should have. Then when we talk about what, I mean, what this means, basically what we want to talk, say about the terms is define constraints on the properties. 
So we are talking about the wine ontology. We these are some of the terms that uh, would be relevant to model. So you can see here we have wine, we have the ingredients, we have the winery, the location, and particular information about the wine itself. Then different types of wine, categories of wine. Then you can think of uh, you know um, which wine goes with with particular type of food. That information is also being modeled. Remember in the set of questions that we had, which wine should I have with a particular food? So you are modeling that information also. Questions? Okay. <clears throat> so think of these terms as starting point for creating your classes in the ontology. So what a class basically is? It's a concept in the domain. So uh, what are the different types of classes for our wine domain? We can have wine. We can have winery. We can have a subtype or a subclass of wine called red wines or white wine, and that kind of. So what we are doing is going from an abstract sort of concept to more specific type of concepts here. So red wine and white wine and that kind of things. So a class is basically a collection of individual or instances that have same type of properties. Uh, wine, white wine from 1954, 1984, 1990. What are the common theme across all of them is their white wine. So that's why white wine is the class, and these are all the individual or instances of uh, the, the white wine. So as I said, so a glass of California wine, so these are the instances of, of uh, maybe California wine. You can have a subclass of wine. Um, hmm. Let's mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Cool. It's working. <clears throat> so once we collect this set of classes, we collected a set of classes. What we are going to do is create a taxonomy. Remember uh, the uh, uh, what was the first the Yahoo web page taxonomy? So you have web as a thing, and then you have web uh, Yahoo Finance and Yahoo Movies. So we are going to create a taxonomy hierarchy of the classes. It's basically uh, in in RDF the tag that we use is is a relationship or it's subsumption relation. There are multiple names of it, but what it basically means is going from an abstract concept to a more specific concept. So uh, you have your standard object-oriented feature also that uh, what are the characteristics of a subclass is inherited from its superclass. It's standard uh, object-oriented um, characteristic. Then you, uh, we think of class as set of elements and subclass as subset. I mean, uh, as I said, you have all these individual or instance real, real world instances and you create a class out of that. And the subclass you can think of as a subset of those set of instances. So wines, all wines, white wine is a particular subset of the set of uh, wines. Now <coughs> they show examples of um, subclass here. So apple is a subclass of fruit, red wine is a subclass of wine, and um, this particular type of wine is a subclass of red wine. Now this is how it will look like in Protege. How many of you have actually seen this kind of taxonomy? You have already seen, right? <coughs> so you can read it. So wine is the most abstract class. Then you have different types of wines, and among these different red wines, you have, uh, according maybe to uh, the color and maybe the, the reason, region, and within the region also, uh, based on the region also, you have red body you also have. You have further levels of. Uh, um, uh, the specific types of wines. Uh, this is called bottom class. We'll get into that when we actually create the ontology. That's fine. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there are different ways of actually creating that taxonomy. One is top down, is generally what I personally have experience in. What you do is you collect this set of terms and you create a taxonomy or a class hierarchy out of that. So, what you're doing is you already know what you're modeling and you know which are the abstract terms that I'm going to model as class, and what is the relationship between these set of terms. What you can also have is bottom-up, 
uh, one of uh, my lab colleagues here, Christopher Thomas, what he does is he goes through Wikipedia articles, gets, uh, crawls out information about that, tries to cluster them according to different types. So they, he can cluster all the instances of uh, red wine, perhaps. And his algorithm is able to identify there are different types of red wine. So it makes sense to create a class called red wine. And these would all be individuals of red wine. So it's a bottom-up approach. You collect all the individuals, then you cluster them according to different categories, and then you cre create classes. Yeah, question. How do you differentiate whether you want to make a subclass or whether you want to make some characteristic as a property of the class? Very good question. I feel that's not a solved problem. Um, it depends on your application requirements. And more specifically, we'll get into that later on. So this is actually one of the issues that you will face later on, that should I model this as a, a subclass, uh, actually a class, or should I model this as a property? And there are dif different uh, consequences of your modeling decision, that uh, if you model it as a class, if there are many instance, many types or many um, occurrences of that particular characteristic, you will have lots of properties. Or if you model it as a class, so having multiple types of lot of number of properties in uh, your ontology can be messy because uh, properties are very strictly interpreted class if you delete a particular class you it doesn't affect your ontology that much uh, but if you delete a property it can uh, have issues in your ontology because it's linking two classes or two entities together and you're deleting a property means you are, may actually leave a class out isolated in a particular way or make it inconsistent in a call for its interpretation. So generally, uh, it's an application-driven decision. From our experience, we would say don't model if the occurrence of a characteristic is going to be numerous, don't model it as a property, model it as a class rather. But we can come to that later. Um. We have had uh, a good bit of experience in building whole variety of ontologies. I had a company uh, that had uh, applications in financial services market. And, uh, uh, over the period of time, we have built ontology for healthcare, biology, biomedical, uh, sensor, and variety of other domains. And so, uh, some of this is sort of art in that uh, you learn from experiences. Um, for example, I noticed a significant differences when you try to model the natural world. Uh, you know, sort of say biology or uh, things of that nature versus uh, man-made world where we talk about modeling uh, sensors or uh, travel. Uh, then uh, the, the type of ontologies that we end up developing are pretty different. For example, the human, uh, uh, you know, when you model the human um, developed world, uh, the things are more regular, the kind of, you know, uh, and, and things are uh, you know, organized while the natural world is what it is and sometimes um, your knowledge in some part is very deep and the other part is not very deep and so that's one thing. The second thing is uh, ontologies uh, uh, are not, even though they are supposed to be referenced in that domain, they are not always um, uh, static, meaning what, it doesn't mean that you develop once and it remains exactly the same. Almost all of them will probably be extended but some of them will be updated and changed as the things change also. And um, <coughs> Uh, that may also reflect these things. Uh, so, some of the domain, for example, in the social domain, where we um, uh, try to uh, uh, use model, uh, conceptual model driven or ontology driven support for social media applications, uh, then the things will change very fast. Uh, uh, there is typically no prior uh, knowledge available to define the ontology for Katrina, uh, you know, related uh, happening and you know, emergency management. And it kind of evolves very fast. Uh, or you look at some DHS application, which may be of relevance to you. Uh, and then, then if you're trying to uh, handle those kind of situations, you may be you may be into situation where you want to model things that more you know change very fast. And also the new information knowledge being created is created by highly dispersed collective intelligence in a way. A lot of people kind of have these different parts of knowledge or information that itself can be culled into making a knowledge and then brought into the ontology. And so again, the, the, the whole dynamics of creation of the ontologies are, are quite different for that also. Um, okay. um, the third part is a combination of the two. So you can start with set of concepts here 
then you can collect some uh, information on the individuals and try to uh, create your subclass hierarchy later on. So you can have a combination also of top-down as well as bottom-up. It depends on, on what your application domain is. Now, this, I mean, we are very familiar being computer scientists that documentation is important. When you define a class, it's important to describe in plain text what that class actually represents. Because four months down the line, you have no idea why you actually modeled red wine um, body and you did not create this red wine and link it to a location called body. So that would have also represented the same information. So it's very important to describe what your class means uh, in plain language and maybe also list a set of assumptions that you made while creating that uh, uh, class. Also, it's very important to create a list all the synonyms of a particular class especially like in uh, biomedical domain or life sciences or even in geographical domain, a particular term may have a list of synonyms. And if you list them, what happens is uh, an application or a person uh, using the ontology can use the synonyms also to interpret what that concept means correctly. Um, so documentation, uh, yeah, so it's as important as com computer code, true. Um, it's not working again. I wonder, and just one more thing that uh, uh, in some cases the ontologies are driven uh, primarily, and what Satya has done is by talking to the experts. And experts are typically involved in building ontology, they give the knowledge. In some cases, uh, the ontologies are um, uh, built um, uh, by um, uh, using the corpus, and you already mentioned the Wikipedia example. Uh, in some cases, the ontologies are. Um, uh, develop over a long period of time and in some cases you create it in a matter of hours and, and, and days. So again there are also a lot of variations and one shouldn't get worried whether you can do it or not. Um, uh, just, you know, I mean, what, there's no single answer saying will it take, will take two years to build the ontology or not. Sometimes you can build quick and dirty, fairly useful ontology very fast. Oh, one more thing is that in many cases ontologies are being developed based on other, uh, other um, standards development activity. So there may be some metadata standard, and I can use that metadata standard to kind of uh, represent in a knowledge represent language and make it a standard. Uh, so uh, that, for example, when we do sensor ontology, we may learn a lot from the OGC's sensor related uh, standardized activity. A lot of those things then are leveraged. Or the standards body in water management, standards body in oceanography, you know. And you can look at their work so far and then uh, uh, represent the uh, things that they are defining their metadata models as ontologies. So that actually comes back to what you were saying, like you have data in a relational database, and I mean, without ontologies, people have been working till now. I mean, so they are somehow taking care of some of the issues that the ontology makes it easier to address. So you will have metadata standards, or you already have declassification in your database schema. You can take those schema, take that schema, and create ontology uh, classes, and then put the properties explicitly put the properties in there, and put it in a knowledge presentation language like, like OWL, and that's how you have an ontology for a particular domain. So once we have a set of classes, uh, this is how we kind of create a uh, create set of classes and the class hierarchy. Any questions? Next, I'm going to go into the properties part. OK. So the next thing, as I said, is uh, in our lab especially, we focus a lot on these properties or these named relationships that link the classes. And as I gave you an example of the company and the employee, uh, the person, what these properties uh, basically is defining is the characteristics of the class that you want to model in your ontology. So you can have each wine can have color, sugar content, who's the producer, and maybe also what material was used, which year it was produced in, in a wine set is very important. So what are the characteristics that you want to model can be modeled as set of uh, 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 properties or attributes of that particular class. So there are different types of uh, 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 properties. Uh, they are list, some of them are listed here. Uh, this, as I said, is uh, from 2001. Uh, after that, today, there is a, uh, you can think of as a standard ontology for relationship or property modeling. It's called relation ontology. It's again uh, developed by uh, Dr. Barry Smith, as I said, from Sunny Buffalo. It uh, defines 11 fundamental relationships uh, that we can use in creating an ontology. 
it has very well defined uh, meaning so you know what you are getting into when you link two classes with that particular ontology and uh, you can create so those are called properties you can further specialize those set of properties according to your domain so you can have properties sub properties similarly as class sub class you can have properties and sub properties so some examples that they give here is the intrinsic properties extrinsic properties uh, partonomy as i you said you know uh, states and localities so that's a classic partonomy uh, relationship then you have a uh, producer of the wine so uh, now there are uh, what they call i think as simple properties and uh, complex properties has now been named after the web ontology language was standardized they call it uh, this is called data type data type property and this is called object property so what a data type property does is for example i can say what's my birth year it's uh, 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 some numeric value and that numeric value i can data type it as an int for example so i me as a individual or uh, you know uh, uh, an individual of the class person satya has a date of birth a uh, numeric value now the has date of birth the relationship the property is a data type property and it links to a primitive data type what we call in computer science primitive data type that's a numeric value or integer you can also have uh, object properties so for example wine was produced uh, by a particular winery both the instance of the wine this bottle of wine and that particular instance of winery we saw examples are linked by is produced by or that winery is a maker of this wine so that is what we call as object it's linking two objects together as compared to data type where it's linking a particular object to a particular data type thing so that's the difference between uh, data type property read, read this as data type property and read this as object properties and it, it, it's uh, will come across this when we actually get our hands on uh, protege and try to create the ontology again stuck okay okay great um this uh, will come to this i'll skip over this um this actually you define some of the values of what the property is we'll actually have a better example when we actually go to protege so i'll uh, leave that for now um so this uh, we just kind of briefly went over that a subclass kind of inherits all the properties or characteristics of its superclass this is standard thing from object oriented programming and um a, if a class has multiple then Uh, it inherits from all of uh, from bo both or all of its uh, parent classes so example is um, port is actually both a desert wine as well as a red wine so it inherits uh, both the properties of desert wine and red wine um, so this is standard object oriented thing multiple inheritance now those so we started with determining the scope we thought about reusing uh, existing ontology terms then we listed our set of terms that we want to model in the ontology we defined the classes and we defined the class hierarchy then for each of the classes we defined the properties also then now what we are going to do as i said in early you know what the f first thing that i said we can define properties and then we can define constraints or restrictions on those properties so <clears throat> some examples would be a simple one like the name of a wine should be a string you can also have a more complex one that uh, uh, it's not listed here for example uh, they have this geographical location patent so if only a food product is produced from a particular region in the world can it be called that particular uh, name i think some sets of uh, cheese uh, swiss cheese i think or uh, uh, french cheese only if it's pr produced in a particular location in france or location in switzerland can be labeled as that kind of cheese otherwise it's a copyright violation or uh, 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 yeah it's a copyright violation so how do i put that restriction so each wine is being produced in a particular region now i can put a restriction saying that body of wine is only produced in a location called bordeaux which actually has been defined as a 
location in France or uh, location within the uh, country of France. So that is what we call as constraints on the particular properties. So it defines what are the set of possible values that a property can have. I will actually show you how to create uh, constraints on, on, on the uh, properties using Protege. So <clears throat> again, I'll skip over that. Um, so some of the common types of restrictions or constraints that you put is cardinality restrictions. A person can have only one date of birth. Then uh, value types would be a person's date of birth is only a numeric value. It cannot be a string. Then you can also have maximum and minimum saying that uh, a, a US citizen can have a minimum of one uh, social security number and maximum also one. It cannot be more than that. So those kind of minimum and maximum value. And default values, of course, can be um, a wine has color. By default, you can think of a wine has some color values, let's say red, for example. But uh, there might be cases that uh, it can be white or some other color. But by default, let's say majority of the wines are red wines. Actually, that's not a very good example. Okay. Um, some cardinality restrictions so can be, uh, it must have these set of, so a car must have, uh, a sedan must have, uh, let's say, uh, four doors. So that's a cardinality restriction, and it must have that many uh, uh, doors. It can have minimum cardinality saying that a person's uh, date of birth is greater than zero at least, um, and uh, maximum cardinality can be, as I said, a US citizen's uh, uh, social security number can be one value. So that's another maximum cardinality. <clears throat> These are the value types. So you can have uh, based on uh, so wine name is a string, uh, date of birth can be a, a number, and you can have more complex as I discussed earlier, it's produced in a particular region. Now I think it will be a better idea if we, so a property, um, when so uh, slot means basically properties. So a property can have, it has, when it links two objects, one is called the domain, the other is called the range. What it means is date of birth, if we, if we model date of birth as a property, it has something called a domain. Domain means uh, the object from which it is being initiated, from which it starts, sort of, is a person, has to be an instance of a person. So a person has date of birth. And the range, the end value, you can think of the end, if I draw it as, um, as, as a circle with uh, an arrow to another circle, you can think of the uh, arrow end circle as the range and the first circle as the domain of the property. So a person has date of birth, a numeric value is the range. So that's the domain and range of, of properties. Um, so this we went over that subclass inherits all the uh, properties uh, of, of the superclass. Um, of course, this standard object oriented, we can override. Uh, the, um, the subclass can override some of the characteristics of the superclass. You can make the cardinality smaller, um, and so on. So finally, uh, so after we define constraints, we finally create instances of the uh, of the ontology. Any questions still now? Okay. Um, so I, I mentioned that we uh, once we create what we have created till now can be called as a schema of the ontology. Remember, the, so all the classes and the properties, these are abstract representations of the real world entities. Now when we create in individuals or instances, means we are actually going to say that uh, Satya is a person and we are actually going to put a numeric value as the, my date of birth. Similarly, you can also have <coughs> Excuse me. A particular instance of a wine bottle manufactured in 1984, it's actually being labeled as 1984 is an instance. So, wine year of manufacture, some numeric value, instance of wine bottle 1984 as the instance. So, this is how we create instances, individuals. So, uh, by and large, uh, my personal view is that much of the um power of ontology comes from the extension or instances of the ontology. So uh, you can look at an ontology that may have tens of classes, sometimes even uh, four or five hundred classes, but then you have millions of instances. 
and that this is this is, is the actual uh, specific information in that domain. So I would have topology of let's say stock market. Each of uh, the class may be simply the stock being traded on the um, stock exchange, but e, but the ontology, you know, the stress base or extension of the ontology may have uh, um, each of the stocks currently being traded on the market. So every uh, three major stock exchange in the U.S. and all the stocks with their symbols and other things would be in the ontology knowledge base. Uh, now now think about it that think about a situation where uh, you have information systems that is processing data. And your knowledge base or ontology has all this instance knowledge. And compare that with a broker. Over the period of time, broker, you know, probably most broker may remember most of the stock and their symbols. So you look at the symbol and you know what that is. But that is through years of experience per se. And even there, it may be hard pressed for them to keep up with uh, uh, actual listing and listing of the stocks. Uh, some of these days, uh, uh, two or three stocks may be listed or delisted off of, on the market. Right? They may have stock price less than one dollar and they get delisted, for example, after a while. And you can't keep up with that. Computer systems can potentially keep up with that. And so you can have up-to-date knowledge that is applied every time an information processing that does, that gets done. And that can give you huge amount of power. In the context of uh, our, uh, you know, uh, the work that we may do, uh, the sensor data, if you have lots of information, for example, all the information regarding the location, and the geocoding uh, of, the, of, of you know a vector of a, of a, of a space uh, you know coordinates into a location, for example, a mapping of those things. Um, then all this can be uniformly applied and encoded, and whereby something that machine understands very well, either a vector or a coded system, to uh, uh, what humans understand very well, the location, for example, can be direct automatically mapped by the system. And um, once that is done, you can also answer the question saying. You can define a rule that um, uh, I can see that something that is within um, uh, 10 miles uh, to be near. And now uh, you can ask the question whether these two locations are near or not, going back. So all these things can be done, which would be otherwise very hard to do uh, on a dynamic basis by a human, uh, you know, reacting to situations and so on and so forth. Right? So, so there's a huge amount of power that can be done. What that brings into challenge and what Satya would address to some extent is how do you keep up with these changing instances? Schema themselves could change, right? But the instances can change even more frequently, right? Every day, new stocks being updated, uh, you know, uh, instead of delisted. All you have to update this instance base every day, in that case. In other case, they don't change that often. So, in, in case when you are talking about uh, new molecules that are discovered and they will be curated, and some people say, ah, we really actually found a new molecule, that may be done on a periodic basis and we go through a committee and, and so you can set up a process to do that. In other cases, you have to create a automated systems that will uh, automatically update your ontology with extensions or instance based uh, assets. And tools have been developed in some cases, uh, in other cases, there is a lot of work to be done. Okay, uh, <clears throat> these are snapshots, I think. Uh, so now let's go on to actually using Protege and show how to create the wine ontology. So, um, need the system. Hmm? Oh, no. <coughs> go with that. Okay. So uh, all of you have downloaded Protege and in, have installed it, right? Um, can, do, did you find wine.owl file? What we can do is let's let's do this then. Uh, let's open up Protege and um, create a new uh, uh, an ontology from the start. Instead of uh, creating this, I'll close this and I'll actually create one. And you can, uh, we can do this together. And if you have issues, then you can tell me, and we'll try to solve that. So let's create a new ontology. Open a new project. Stop me if, if any of you have uh, are having any problem. So we are on this page. All of us. Okay. So we say we create. Uh, sorry, we don't create from existing. We create a, a owl RDF file. 
with a new ontology then uh, we can name our ontology uh, specific uh, we can give an ontology a specific name let's say we call it uh, on our um, uh, demo dot owl or onr actually wine not owl now we we'll, i'll explain the owl part later on so let's just go with <coughs> excuse me owl dl for now and we will uh, start with the properties view that i'll explain do we have this uh, all of us Are we on the same page? Okay. I can come come there. Okay. Can you see what's the uh, issue there? The train to open up pretty here. Pretty, you got that? Issue. Um, what did you do here? Oh, this is our four. So just change this to ONR wine. Huh? Okay, cool. Um, sorry. <laughs> I don't think I can do that with Protege. Yeah, I can't. Oh, I can. Hold on. Sorry. Is that visible? Better visible? Is that better? You can see. No more. Okay. Maybe a little more. Okay. So. Okay. So let's create. So when we open Protege, the first class by default we have is called Owl Thing. It's just an abstract uh, root of uh, all the classes that we are going to create. Okay. So let's create. Uh, so we will use the terms that we saw in the um, presentation, which were our. Uh, let's go back to our classes. Um, So wine, um, wine, grape, and winery. Let's just model those three terms. So we will create a subclass of our thing. So we'll have winery. So things kind of like object, an object language. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Those are kind of uh, objects. You can think of them as objects. So we created winery. Okay. Now we will create a sibling class. Sibling class means they are at the same level. So, uh, or a subclass of our thing, we are creating <coughs> winery. Then we can create wine, and we can also create, uh, let's say, location. Those are the three classes that we have right now. So what this basically means is that winery, wine, and locations are the three classes at the same level in the class hierarchy. 
same set of same level of abstraction you can think of like that are we all on the same page okay so let's create two types of wine uh, white wine and red wine so what we are doing <coughs> we start with the abstract class of wine and then we are creating more specific type of uh, uh, wine class called red wine now you see here that i put a underscore there right now there are certain you remember why can't i see okay uh, you remember that i had said uh, all the terms in our ontology modeling or the semantic web are unique identifiers and you know we are we all know that uh, urls are unique on the web so what we are doing you can think of this as a url and we are adding a particular r term at the end of it so we are saying this ontology this is the term red wine uh, defined in that ontology now there are certain uh, uh, restrictions on what we can use the characters we can use in a uri so space is generally not allowed in creating a uri so that's why it, uh, we put the underscore there that's just a naming convention so we have red wine and we will <coughs> create a sibling class for red wine called white wine so all of us all of us have this So this is our top level class hierarchy winery wine and location and within wine we have red wine and white wine Okay cool Yes. Okay. yes. <laughs> That's protege four. <coughs> yeah. So you do all this is in entities tab or classes tab? <coughs> Both entities in protege four. You can use entities tab or uh, class tab. Anyone is fine. Yeah. Let's see. I'll just have a look then. Uh, Yeah, you can. Yeah, exactly. There we go. All right. No, all thing, all thing is fine. All thing is fine. And uh, if you can open, what's under red wine? Open that. Yeah, that one. Yeah, you can delete that also. And also something under winery. I think you can delete that also. And you can create one call location. <coughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> Next, let's put some uh, properties for these classes. Okay. We are all on the same page, right? So let's say a wine is uh, manufactured by a winery. So click on the properties tab. You see the properties tab here. Click on the properties tab. This icon says uh, create a new property. 
create a new object property. Remember, I said there are different types of property, two types of properties, data property and object property. We'll create an object property, and we will name it as maker. So, <laughs> a winery is a maker of a we got maker okay then we can create an another uh, object property let's call it uh, located in so you see what i'm doing here is kind of uh, linking together the classes um, uh, a wine is uh, made by a particular winery and the winery is located in a particular location. So how, we have now the two the object properties. How do we create, uh, how do we link actually in the ontology the classes that we want to? So maker, let's click on maker. Now you see here on the right hand side uh, a little uh, down that we have to define the domain and the range of that particular property particular object property. You click on this icon which is uh, classes. If you click on that, we get all the classes <coughs> excuse me that we had defined earlier. So maker so a wine has a particular maker. So we can say wine is the domain of this property. So click on just select wine and say okay you will see that now domain of maker is wine. Similarly, the range of maker would be a winery. So a wine is made by a winery or a wine has a maker winery. So you can interpret it like this, wine has actually we can change the name of the uh, of the property has maker which is more intuitive so wine has maker winery and you can edit the name of the properties here in in the tab up up here so you can say has maker winery similarly we can do the same thing for located in let's put in the domain for that that a winery has look is located in a particular location or geographical location, right? When we started editing the properties, uh -huh. um, that wasn't tied to the our class that we had selected on the other tab, was it? No, no, no this is no. just its own use doing properties yeah. straight up. Yes, okay, that's yes. why we. Okay. Okay, so we have connected all our three classes. You are seeing the classes here, but you can also, if you, so you see this is the logic view that we have by default. We can also have a properties view. If you click, select that one, you see a wine has maker. We get the property on that. And say a wine has maker, and we know from our properties tab has maker a winery. Similarly, a winery is located in, <coughs> excuse me, a, a particular location. Can all of us see that? Okay, so now we did, we followed the two first steps of ontology creation, right? So we collected the term, uh, sorry, the three uh, steps. Collected the terms, we created our class hierarchy, we put in the properties, and we linked the properties to the relevant classes. So if you see here, uh, what the uh, property of wine is, it has a maker, you see the subclasses also inherit that property. Same object properties, right? So. Now we can put restriction. We'll, we'll, we'll see how we can put restrictions. So let's say 
a particular type of red wine. I don't know if Bordeaux wine is a red wine, I guess. Okay. <laughs> I'm not that familiar. <laughs> okay. So let's put uh, Bordeaux wine as a uh, um, type of red wine. Okay. Now, since we didn't uh, link our wines to locations, but we linked the winery to locations, let's say we create a subclass of winery. For example, uh, we can say all the wineries located in Bordeaux, we'll call it Bordeaux Winery. Bordeaux? Bordeaux. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, please excuse me about my French. Bordeaux, Bordeaux Winery. Okay? So, now Bordeaux Winery, we see here, has location, a particular location. We can create a subclass of location. Okay, let's let's create a subclass of location. Now you see here that we we face one of the dilemmas uh, that Bordeaux is an uh, instance of a location should be created as an instance individual or should be created as a class. Now we can create it as a class and we can easily link Bordeaux winery to being located in uh, Bordeaux location or we can do it at the instance level also, individual levels also. What that means is we can have a list or instances or individuals of Bordeaux winery, have an instance of location Bordeaux, and link only those wineries in Bordeaux to location located in Bordeaux. So how do we, let's do with the individuals part. Let's create an instance of location. Okay, so I'm kind of skipping one step instead of creating restrictions now. I'm uh, first creating individuals. So you see that individual tab here? We'll create an individual of location Bordeaux. Okay? So location, you again click on this icon here which says create instance. Let's create, name it as Bordeaux. Okay. <coughs> so this is this is an actual piece of data, right? Exactly. It's an actual location. So I can uh, say uh, location border. Now what we can do is also create instances of Bordeaux winery. For example, let's say I name it as BD underscore one. It's some arbitrary example instance of that. Now, when we come back to the OWL classes tab, I can put a restriction on the located in here to say all the winery, Bordeaux winery, are located in all values from particular instances, and that instance is Bordeaux. What did you click again to do that? Sorry. Yeah, so uh, I just want so. Yeah. What I'm doing here is we have Bordeaux Winery yep, yep. located in restriction here. Okay. Yep, got it. Yep. So here we can specify the value. Now there are different types of restriction here. This is called generally called as a, a universal restriction. This is called existential restriction, but I won't get into that right now. 
so all values from basically means we are saying uh, all border <coughs> excuse me are <coughs> located in border so sorry uh, following me then we click on this icon here which says insert individual yeah click on that click on location you see location 1 that means there's an one individual of location we click on that we get border we say okay and we have that restriction and then again okay okay <laughs> i hope protege didn't crash is the dialog supposed to go away yeah Ah, okay, okay, okay. The restrictions are? No, 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 no. I made a mistake. So uh, the thing is, uh, we can put restrictions on individuals to individuals. This is not allowing me to put uh, restriction on the class itself. So what we will have to do is put a restriction, uh, create a subclass of location called Bordeaux, and then put the restriction. Oops. Okay, so if we create a subclass of location, then we can put a restriction on the located in that all values are from. I'll do this slowly. I'm just showing right now. So you put restrictions on a subclass, but you can't do it on a full class. No, 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 no. First, we created an instance of what. We create an instance of location called Bordeaux. Yeah. Now the problem is we can link uh, rest, uh, individuals to another individual. Mm -hmm. I was trying to put a restriction on a class with respect to an individual. Mm -hmm. So for that we had to create another class for, or we could have not created an individual of Bordeaux. We could have created a subclass of location called Bordeaux and then put the restriction. Mm -hmm. So the ob this is an object property, yeah. and we are putting on the restriction with respect to a class. That what are the values that it can take? R remember, so uh, <coughs> the binary is the domain of the property located in. So restrictions are expressed in terms of classes, not instantiations. There are certain types of restrictions you can put on the instances also. Okay. But for what I'm showing right now is just for class level. So you can have restrictions on what are the individuals that a particular property can take, and you can define that also. But this one is right now I'm showing only with respect to the class level. Sir, yeah. Hmm. How do I put restrictions here in 4.4? So you have to uh, click on the superclasses tab on the right hand side, Corey. Ah. Uh, um, I, I'll show you. I'll show you later. Right click on the superclasses tab. It will open up a dialog box. <coughs> okay. So, should we do it? Do this slowly. Okay. So let's create a subclass of border location, uh, border location as subclass of location. We created that. Then click on border binary. Click on the restrictions part. Let me just uh, delete this for now. We'll do it again. So click on the restrictions part. We are going to make the restriction on this given property that all the values. What this means is this is the domain. So Bordeaux binary located in only Bordeaux. So we are going to click on the what's the insert class icon. So if you click on that, we get all the list of classes that we have created till now. <coughs> we find the border location, select that one, and we 
What you will see here is this green uh, tick mark which says our restrictions is correct. The previous one, if you remember, when I was trying to put the restrictions according to the individual, it was not accepting it. So this means that this is correct. And we can just say OK. And if we open it up, it says border winery located in border location. That's the restriction. <coughs> So we can have similar restrictions on any property. Location is an interesting example because in real life, um, there are some. It's almost an infinite number of locations, right? So you wouldn't want to represent every location as a subclass. No, 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 no. So we could have a restriction that says a city name or a state. Exactly. You can do that also. You can do say that uh, for all the individuals of this class. With this relationship, yeah. are going to take these enumerated lists of individuals. Okay. You right. can do that also. So, well, that's <laughs> have millions of subclasses, right? So, For every exactly. Right? Exactly. Okay. So we're saying the located the value of the located in property has to be an in, a member basically of an instance of the border location subclass. Yes. So when we created an instance of location. Border would be actually an instance of the border location. You could have 50 border lo instances of border location. As instances. It has to be one of those values. Yes. Yes, exactly. So here um, we can put a restriction on border wine also that it is manufactured by border wineries. We can put a restriction on that also. So similarly, if you click on border wine, has maker, we can put a restriction that it has values <laughs> border winery. Okay. So, <coughs> so with this, we kind of have covered all the steps that we discussed in the slides, right? So we have a class hierarchy. We have list of properties. We put restrictions on the properties. We also created individuals. So we basically followed all the steps. I can give an example of. Uh, so right now we have the two data type, uh, two object properties. We can create a data type property also. So let's create a data type property. Click on the properties tab, then click on the data type sub tab here. We can create, let's say, has uh, um, year of, or yeah, has year of uh, manufacture, let's say. Okay. So, what is the domain and what is the range for that? We'll define the domain for that as a wine has year of manufacture, right? And the range, if you remember, are the primitive data types. We can't define classes here, and we know that it's going to be a year so let's we can define it as an integer so how we read this is a wine has year of manufacture some integer value so that's an example of a data type property
So if you go back to your classes tab, you can see that all wines have has maker object property and has year of manufacture as data type property. Okay. So if you are good, uh, I'll just briefly, I think, go over what are the advanced <coughs> steps in this. Sorry. Any questions still now? OK. <coughs> So some of the more common problems and solutions that we face in ontology engineering, we have kind of seen that already uh, when I was trying to create a restriction for individuals on a class, uh, uh, for a class uh, with respect to object property. So, but there are other things also. It is very important, as Dr. mentioned, that this is more of an art. So there is no single correct class hierarchy. So it depends on the requirements of your application. You can have an individual Bordeaux, you can have a Bordeaux location as a subclass of location. It depends on the requirements of your class. And one, one interesting observation to be made is that at a very gross level, um, you can divide the semantic applications in three very broad categories. One is uh, improving access uh, to the information like search, browsing, and so on and so forth. Other is integrating the data and um, uh, you know, from multiple sources for heterogeneous data, there are syntactical and structurally heterogeneous data, but semantically uh, related data. And the third is analysis uh, and decision making and insight and that kind of stuff, right? So situational awareness, awareness and other things like that. And as you go from uh, the uh, you know, search to integration to analysis, uh, the uh, expectations on the richness of the representation the correctness of the representation, the denseness, the uh, uh, you know the use of uh, uh, relationships appropriately, and the use of um, uh, you know the, the detailed definition of the classes and the constraints on them uh, typically increases. There is little or no practical value of having the constraints specified if your application is purely to do better search per se. Uh, but as you go towards integration. Uh, and then into analysis, uh, quote unquote reasoning, and reasoning is a pretty broad term, there are many types of reasoning, uh, the role of that increases. So uh, thereby the uh, amount and afford of uh, spent in developing correct and complete ontology uh, is also uh, significantly higher. But that investment then is supposed to be paid off by uh, more reasoning by being able to do better analysis, machine doing more of the computation, semantic uh, computations uh, uh, to, to pay back that investment that you have made in defining uh, the detail of the world. And uh, there again, there are, you know, the, the, the standard reasoning, the based on inferencing in search is one issue, but uh, there's another very important one um, uh, that should not be that, that for, for a particular perspective, which is essentially what you do in RDF alone, where you or basically whatever you gain by traversal of the links or relationships, relationships that that is a huge value in many many applications. And so again, uh, the things will vary as to which parts of the ontology design and modeling plays important role and what is necessary. I think I have figured out <coughs> why I was not being able to put the individual restriction. Uh, so the particular type of restriction we are using is universal quantifiers. I think in uh, Protege it allows you to do uh, that particular class. The range for the given property can have only these list of instances, and I wasn't using that. I was using the universal quantifier, which was the uh, uh, error that I was doing. I think uh, Cody, when he discusses the sensor ontology, can just show that. So. Uh, we can have multiple inheritance. Uh, uh, so why is this not showing up? Okay, um, I think there's something wrong. Oh, okay, the, uh, this was the old version of uh, PowerPoint. So uh, class can have multiple superclasses, and uh, uh, all the uh, characteristics of the uh, its multiple parents can be inherited by the subclass. 
when there are conflicts, uh, different systems actually resolve it differently. When there are conflicts, is a standard uh, object oriented, how do you resolve, resolve when you have multiple inheritances? Now, disjoint classes is when we create created the sibling classes like wine and winery, what when you said they are, we can specify that wine and winery are disjoint means instances or individuals of wine class cannot also be instances or individuals of the winery class. That's the disjointness. Here they give example of um, uh, uh, rose, rose wine, red wine, and white wine, and they say they are disjoint. Basically, if an instance of red wine and white wine and rose wine cannot have overlap in terms of the instances. That's the disjointness. Uh, this again figure is not showing up. I'm sorry. Uh, this old version of PowerPoint, that's why. Uh, again, these are standard object-oriented issues. When you have multiple inheritance, then you can have cycles in the class hierarchy. Uh, that's one of the main reasons why Java does not allow you to have multiple inheritance. Then uh, uh, siblings in a class hierarchy, all the binary and location where sibling classes in our hierarchy that we created, they must be at the same level of generality. Means when you are modeling, let's say, Honda, Toyota, and a Nissan, these are sibling classes because they are same level of abstraction, that these are manufacturers of uh, cars, primarily. So it's basically sections and subsections of a, of a book. Now, as I said, the class hierarchy, it's more of an art. So if you are having only one ch subclass of a given class, most likely you don't need that uh, generalization specialization. You can take the uh, child as the superclass itself. You don't have to create the superclass. Only if you have, let's say, more than one, uh, you should be creating that subclass, uh, superclass hierarchy. Um, then uh, it's very subjective what's the perfect family size. So a class can uh, have more than a dozen uh, subclasses uh, in some real world applications like biomedicine and all that. You can see like uh, a subclass has like 50, 50 60 subclasses. And uh, that's kind of natural way, uh, reflects the natural way of how things are in the real world itself. So there are no hard and fast rules. Uh, that says that you cannot have, let's say, 50 or 60 subclasses of a given class. But, yeah, so a natural classification may not exist. But <laughs> if possible, you sh should try and create subcategories among those 50 and 60 classes. If not, that, that's also fine. Um, so uh, how to name the classes that we are creating? Uh, wine is not a kind of wines. So what it means is you cannot have a... a, a uh, subclass of, uh, of wines called wine and say this is actually one type of wine. It, it actually conceptually it ref refers uh, to the uh, wine itself and you use the term wine instead of uh, trying to create a subclass out of that. So <clears throat> uh, wine is an instance okay. Uh, they should, yeah, so you should be consistent in, how, consistent in how you are naming your classes. Either they all should be singular, all should be plural. Generally, what I have seen is uh, they tend to be singular because they are reflecting, uh, reflecting the, act, the conceptual uh, abstraction of, of, the, of the real world domain. I have actually never seen, so this is not properly coming out. Okay. Uh, this is, I wouldn't say is a very, uh, it's, it's not standard interpretation. So there are some people who say, uh, here Natasha is saying that classes represent concepts in the domain, not their names. Uh, and also, uh, when I say a wine, uh, am I, uh, the term wine in my ontology, does it reflect to a value that I have in my database? Or does it actually refer to the actual thing out there? So it's very controversial in biomedicine that a gene in a database, as compared to a gene on the uh, slide, which is the gene that I'm referring to when I'm <coughs> excuse me, modeling it in, the, in my ontology. Is it the identifier or is it the actual thing out there? Generally, we take to think it is basically we tend to take it as they're representing concepts in the domain. But, but uh, some, some people have issues with that. So that's what we have. Um, domain, I think we covered most of what they're defining here. Uh, 
then also this we covered basically this thing what should be the domain and the range values we covered that um, uh, this is an example of that uh, you can also have so remember we had a maker so you can have is manufactured by so maker a wine uh, has maker a winery you can also have winery manufactures wines so manufactures and has maker are exactly inverse relationships uh, so that's uh, default values we went through that and it's very important to when you model your ontology as one of the first steps is define your scope it's important to limit your scope of your ontology you don't want to model all the information in your domain it's almost impossible because there are limitations in the modeling language itself plus you don't want all the information for your application so you don't want to model all the information uh, in a particular domain so um, that's uh, about it I'll just briefly go over uh, what are the representation languages in the from the semantic web community in representing ontologies uh, this is an old slide so this is this daml plus oil has been replaced by owl actually owl 2 now uh, which dr pascal hitzler actually was one of the members who contributed towards the new standard um, rdf schema um, is the uh, more simplistic uh, language for modeling and RDF is what uh, Pratik will cover tomorrow. Uh, briefly, uh, what's the difference between the semantic web modeling languages is how much we, how how much expressivity they have. Like this class level restrictions are not allowed in basic RDFs, but it's allowed in more expressive languages in like OWL. But the problem is, more expressive it it, it is, the more difficult it is to process or reason with it. So there is always the trade off. So um, the images are not there. Um, I think we covered that. So uh, instances of a class use the RDF type. So Bordu would be uh, connected to the class uh, location by this uh, relationship RDF type. Then uh, RDF subclass is what the relationship that we used in implicitly when we created the class hierarchy. Uh, you can have sub properties so has maker you can have um, let's say a more specialized version of uh, let what has location you can also have is capital of is capital of is a more specialized property of has location you can think of like that actually that's the wrong example but uh, 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 has uh, sub property of example but on me you can have part of then you can has uh, uh, more specialized um, are located in yeah or things like that but you can have sub properties of of given property uh, these all we covered uh, cardinality constraints range on property domain and properties uh, this I won't go into so this has been replaced by owl2 if we can just switch back So this is basically from my, I, I'll finish my talk. This is what we can take away. What's an ontology? Why we should build? How to build? And I very briefly went over semantic web and web ontology language. These are some of the references. Uh, this slide, the the slide that I was using throughout the talk was from this website. It's uh, ontology 101. You can take a document also available, which very well explains how the wine ontology uh, was uh, created. Then this is a general uh, location uh, link to the semantic web uh, community activities at World Wide Web, and uh, this is the new language web ontology language OWL2 uh, th uh, that is used to create ontologies now. Any questions? Thank you. All right, shall we take five minutes break? All right. I was wondering.